Good morning, afternoon or evening to you all. My name is Ian Loveday. I'm a senior partner at ERM and on behalf of the Energy Institute and the UK Committee of the World Petroleum Council, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on the hard realities of a low carbon energy system. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, HKA and Shell, for their support in making this webinar happen. This workshop is jointly hosted by the Energy Institute and the UK Committee of the World Petroleum Council. The Energy Institute is an independent network of professionals spanning the whole energy system, convening and facilitating debate. The EI brings together expertise so that energy can be better understood, managed and valued. The World Petroleum Council's main purpose is to catalyze and facilitate dialogue amongst internal and external stakeholders aimed at seeking solutions to key technical, social, environmental and management challenges in global energy issues for the benefit of mankind. Um, a few housekeeping points before I pass you to the session chair, Karina Radford, and we kick off the session. During the webinar, you will all be able to submit questions by the chat function to the speakers. You don't need to wait until the panel session to send questions. Just navigate to the chat and select Karina's name from the drop down menu. Your microphones have been muted, and similarly, you will be unable to use your camera. Also, to improve sound quality, I recommend that you use headphones to lessen in. Please note that the webinar will not run under Chatham House rules. It will be recorded, posted on the Energy Institute website, and a link will be sent to you all afterwards. I will now pass you to our chair. Karina Radford. Karina is a partner at White and & Case and her practice spans across the energy industry from fossil fuels through conventional and renewable energy to innovative technologies. Her sought after industry expertise is further reinforced by her versatile skill set across the full breadth of financing investment structures, including traditional project finance, structured hold co or mezzanine financings, acquisition financings and structure equity investments. Karina frequently leads teams on truly global and innovative energy transactions. Over to you, Karina. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be here and to be chairing today's event. I'm going to do my best to blend in with the experts or certainly hide in plain sight. We certainly will have no problems creating an engaging and lively discussion today. So today's session is going to kick off with a keynote presentation on the fascinating IEA report that came out last week, Net Zero by 2050, a roadmap for the global energy sector. And this is going to be from one of the lead authors and coordinators of that report, Christoph McGlade. And they're going to put a few questions to Christoph coming out of the report and his presentation. And, and then we're going to move to a panel session where Christoph and I will be joined by some illustrious representatives of the very global energy sector that Christoph has written about. And we're going to dig a little deeper into what the report means to them and engage in a wider discussion around the hard realities of, of achieving the targets for net zero. So without further ado, let me introduce Christoph properly. Christoph McGlade is a senior energy analyst at the IEA, having joined them in 2015. He leads the oil, gas and climate analysis within the World Energy Outlook series and has driven many of the special focus topics of that series over the last six years, including recent reports on achieving net zero emissions and the role of the oil and gas industry in the energy transition. So, Christoph, it's our pleasure to have you here today and I'll hand over to you now for your presentation. Thank you very much, Karina, for those kind words and, and good morning, good afternoon and good evening to, to everybody who's listening. I mean, it's a real pleasure to speak with you all today about the IEA's first ever ro global roadmap to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And as um, all of you or many of you will know, um, a number of governments and companies around the world have given themselves the target to reach net zero emissions by the year 2050. And it was in this context that we were requested by the UK COP presidency to translate their goals the goals of governments and companies into a roadmap for the energy sector to reach net zero emissions by 2050. So jumping straight in to look at what needs to happen to be on track for net zero emissions in 2050. From today, we need to cut CO2 emissions globally 
by around about 13 billion tons over the next 10 years. Unfortunately, most of the technologies that are needed to do this are available and are cost effective already. So to give some examples of what would need to happen, annual capacity additions of solar PV and wind have quadrupled over the past decade. And in our net zero pathway, they need to quadruple again over the next um, 10 years. To put some numbers on this, um, recently in, in 2020, there was around about 250 gigawatts of wind and solar installed globally, and this needs to rise to 1,000 gigawatts by 2030. Wind and solar provide about 40% of electricity generation globally in 2030, up from about 9% uh, today. And what this means is that in 2030, it would be equivalent to building the world's largest solar park that exists today every single day in the year 2030. Another thing that needs to happen is on the electrification of, of the transport sector. And electric car sales must rise 18 fold over the next 10 years. In 2020, around about 5% of cars sold globally were electric. And by 2030, this needs to be around about 60%. For 2035, globally, there are no new sales of internal combustion engine cars. Boosting energy efficiency is also key in our net zero pathway. There are many efficiency measures in buildings, in industry, appliances, transport, amongst other sectors that can be put into effect and scaled up very quickly. And that's what we see happening in our net zero pathway. As a result of deploying all of these efficiency measures, and efficiency measures are very much front loaded in the net zero pathway, the energy intensity of the global economy falls by around about 4% per year over the period of 2030. In recent years, the, the energy intensity has fallen by less than 2% per year. And so roughly speaking, we need to triple efforts on efficiency. Our pathway to net zero emissions um, globally occurs even while there's very rapid economic growth. So over the period of 2050, the economy expands by around about 150%, and the global population increases by around about 2 billion people. And at the same time, there's a huge surge in clean energy investment. Total investment in clean energy technologies rises to more than $4, billion, $4 trillion by 2030, which is more than triple current levels. So for example, by 2030, annual investment in renewables, just in the electricity sector, is around $1.3 trillion. And this is more than the highest level that was ever spent on fossil fuel supply, which was $1.2 trillion back in 2014. Investment in clean energy infrastructure also tripled from around about $300 billion in recent years to $900 billion. And this is for things like electricity networks, electric vehicle charging points, hydrogen infrastructure, and so on and so on. But at the same time, there's also a large drop in fossil fuel investment in the net zero pathway. Investment in, in fossil fuel supply in 2030 is around about $300 billion. And this is similar to su the suppressed levels that we saw in 2020. But after 2030, investment falls even further and it drops to just over $100 billion by the year 2050. And one of the big milestones in our pathway to net zero is that beyond projects that have already been committed, no new oil and gas fields are approved for development as of the end of 2021. In addition, no new coal mines or mine extensions are required. And also not needed are many of the LNG liquefaction facilities that are currently under construction or at the planning stage. Fossil fuel prices are also much lower um, than in recent years. For example, the oil price drops to around about $35 per barrel by 2030, and it drifts slowly towards $25 per barrel in 2050. Nonetheless, the surge in, in clean energy investment actually leads to a major economic boost as the world emerges from the COVID-19 crisis. Based on our joint analysis with the IMF, with the International Monetary Fund, we estimate that the additional spending on clean energy technologies could add an extra 0.4 percentage points per year to annual GDP growth during the 2020s. 
And this means that in 2030, it's like adding another Japan to the world's economy. However, I think it's important to recognize that there would be very large differences in the impacts between different regions. The declines in fossil fuel income is going to impact many countries, and these countries would need to accelerate the process of reforming inefficient fossil fuel subsidies and also speeding up efforts to move away from the use of hydrocarbon resources towards using those resources to produce low emissions fuels. I mentioned earlier that we basically have all of the technologies available in the market today to achieve the emission reductions required to 2030. But a full transition to net zero emissions by 2050 will, re will require more than that. And it's gonna require tackling emissions in sectors like long distance transport and heavy industries. And while we know the kinds of technologies that can help to achieve the decarbonization of these sectors, we don't yet have these technologies um, available in the market. Many of them are only available at a demonstration or even the prototype stage today. And there's many different technology options that are available to help decarbonize these sectors, covering options such as electrification, carbon capture, hydrogen and bioenergy. Some of them are shown on, on the screen here. But in total, putting all of these together, we estimate that around about 50% of the emission reductions in the net zero um, pathway come from such technologies that are not yet currently available in the market. But I just want to make one, make one point very clear here, and that's that innovation is not in conflict with the rollout of existing technologies. They're two sides of the same coin. The 2020s really needs to be the decade of both of rolling out known technologies that are available in the market today to drive down emissions to the extent possible, and also the decade of innovation to ensure that all of these new technologies are available in the market and can be scaled up at the pace that is then necessary. Turning now to energy security, which is clearly a major concern of, of all um, governments. It's clear that a pathway to net zero emissions that ignores energy security is going to be a much longer and much more challenging pathway. The drop in oil and gas demand and the increased diversity of the energy sources that will be used around the world will reduce some traditional risks associated with um, energy security, but they certainly don't disappear entirely. And because no new oil and gas fields are needed in the net zero pathway, supplies become increasingly concentrated in a small number of low cost producers. For example, for oil, the result is that the share of OPEC in global oil supply rose from around about 34% in 2020 to 52% in 2050. And this is a level that is higher than at any point in the history of oil markets. The energy transition also requires substantial quantities of critical minerals. The scale up of wind, solar PV and batteries all require large quantities of minerals such as copper, cobalt, manganese and various rare earth elements. And total demand for these minerals grows almost sevenfold in our net zero pathway. The production and processing of these minerals is often more geographically concentrated than is the case for oil or for natural gas. And this could create new energy security concerns. And if supply can't keep up with demand, there could be price volatility and additional costs for transitions. Finally, there's potential new vulnerabilities associated with the need to maintain reliable, flexible and secure energy electricity systems. Electricity demand grows two and a half times in our net zero pathway. And at the same time, the share of solar PV and wind rises from 9% in 2020 to almost 70% in 2050. And the result is that the need for electricity system flex flexibility quadruples over the period of 2050. There's a growing role for demand response, for battery storage, for dispatchable low emission sources of generation, and expanding um, smarter and more digital electricity grids also enables enhanced power system flexibility. Every country has its own um, circumstances and will make its own plans for the transition towards net zero. But I'd like to finish just by highlight highlighting some of the key global milestones that we see on the road to net zero emissions globally. First of all, um, I mentioned that one of the key results of the pathway is that no new oil and gas fields are required. But this doesn't mean that the skills and um, expertise of fossil fuel companies necessarily need to go to waste. 
The oil and gas industry could play a key role in helping to develop at scale a number of clean energy te technologies, such as carbon capture, biofuels, and offshore wind. The, the scale up of these technologies and bringing down their costs will re rely on large scale engineering and project management capabilities, which are qualities that are a good match to many of the large oil and gas companies that we have today. For supplying the increased level of critical minerals, clearly mining expertise is going to be very valuable. Another example where oil and gas companies and fossil fuel companies could play a role is for hydrogen, which is set to become an increasingly important part of our energy mix. Today, there's about 250 megawatts of electrolyzers installed globally. And in our pathway, this reaches 850 gigawatts by 2030. We also need to scale up carbon capture and storage. There's around about 40 million tons captured globally today, and this needs to increase to 1,600 million tons by 2030. Another big milestone on the road towards net zero emissions globally is for the electricity sector, as it's the first sector to achieve net zero emissions at the global level by 2040. And indeed, this occurs earlier in, in aggregate in advanced economies with reach net zero emissions for the electricity sector by 2035. And just to conclude, we of course acknowledge that this scenario that I've been discussing is just one possible pathway towards net zero emissions. It's certainly not the only pathway that exists. Our aim with the report is simply to inform and to stimulate the debate on how we can achieve our collective climate goals. And I'm very much looking forward to our discussion and to your reactions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christoph. That was an, an elegant summary of, of a huge amount of work that's gone into that report, including from yourself. So thank you very much indeed. Um, and maybe you and I can just spend the next few minutes just focusing on a few questions to dig a little deeper into some aspects of it together. And I wanted to just start really, you know, with the introduction to the report for those of you that have, have read it, makes a, makes a strong statement that the gap between sort of rhetoric and action needs to close. So if we just take a step right back and we think about the philosophy effectively for a second, I mean, do you think that's what we have at the moment? Do you think the public sector and the private sector, if I can group them that way, have just come out with rhetoric, or do you think there is action already underway? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Karina. It's a it's a crucial point, and, it, and this is something that we we did look at in a bit of detail in the report. So, just to put some some numbers on on what we're talking about around the world, um, around about seventy percent of emissions comes from um, from countries that have made net zero commitments. And similarly, around about 70% of global GDP comes from those, those countries with, with net zero commitments. However, one of the things that we conclude from the report is that unfortunately this is, this is not enough. And if you were to assume that all of those net zero pledges were, were to be achieved, which is, which is a very big if, um, this would still lead to a, a temperature rise of around about 2.1 degrees by the end of the century. And this is clearly um, far away from the 1.5 degrees that governments have have said they would like to, to limit the temperature rise to. And what we clearly conclude, therefore, is that all governments need to increase their ambitions from currently uh, the current nationally determined contributions that are made under the Paris Agreement, and also to increase ambitions from their um, existing net zero pledges. Just a couple of words on, on companies. Of course, we, we've also seen um, very good progress in, in that regard. We looked at a number of different sectors as part of the report to see what sorts of um, net zero commitments have been made. And we saw, for example, in the technology sector, around about 60% of revenue in the technology sector comes from companies that um, have net zero emissions uh, targets already. But whenever we started looking through all of the different um, pledges that, that companies themselves have made, um, we saw that around about 40% haven't actually spelled out how they aim to achieve their net zero pledges. And this is, this is clearly a bit of a problem. It, it, there is an important need to, to support any net zero pledge, whether that's from a country or from a company, with actual concrete measures to achieve those longer term um, goals. One thing that we see from a number of companies that have kind of spelled out how they aim to achieve uh, net zero emissions is a quite a heavy reliance on, on carbon offsets. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the use of carbon offsets can be a cost effective way to, to eliminate emissions, especially from parts of, of value chains where um, reductions are, are challenging, but we really feel that the, the initial focus for, for companies in particular 
has to be from reducing direct emissions reductions. They should really kind of limit the use of offsets to, to areas where emission reductions are most challenging. And the very simple reason for that is it's likely if there is a real global concerted effort towards um, net zero emissions, but there's not going to be an infinite supply of these offsets. There's going to be a limited source of credits that will be consistent with achieving net zero emissions. And so it's important that buying offsets or purchasing credit doesn't distract from the important and, and kind of necessary part of actually reducing emissions. And thanks, Christoph. When we spoke before, I knew your view on offsets was, was a strong one. And obviously it's one that's used a lot um, in dialogue around achieving net zero. So it's interesting to hear what you say there. There's lots of questions coming coming in and there's some questions that go to perhaps the second question I had. Um, so I'll try and I'll blend into that, which is really sort of look focus on governments perhaps for a second. I mean, I think it, that that focus is clear from the report that that that, that the governments have a have maybe the critical role, and we'll come on to look at that perhaps comparatively on the panel a bit, in driving these mandates and standards and creating these disincentive policies as much as these incentive policies. Um, is there a government out there who who you which you think is hitting the right notes at the moment? Or it's a political I think it's... question. I appreciate, Chris. <laughs> just in terms of in terms of sort of you know approach to the agenda. Um, I mean, because clearly it will take a, a, all governments to come together to a certain extent. I'd just be keen to know your views on today and who's heading in the right direction. Certainly. So I think one one thing just to bear in mind about this was a global pathway and we, we didn't get into um, or we didn't discuss in detail um, a lot of what hap happens in individual countries. The modelling itself was kind of at a country level, but the, the aim of the report itself was to provide a global roadmap. However, we did provide a bit of a distinction between what happens in advanced economies and what happens in emerging markets and developing economies. And one thing that we saw was that um, advanced economies um, achieve net zero emissions, again in aggregate, earlier than the rest of the world, around about five years earlier. So if the world is to reach a net zero emissions in 2050, that means the energy sector, CO2 emissions in advanced economies needs to be net zero around about 2045. And when you look at a number of different countries around the world, they're, they're not always aligned with, with that goal of, of, of uh, net zero um, CO2 for the energy sector in, 20, in 2045 or indeed in 2050. But there are some, I mean, the UK government, for example, has pledged to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions in 2050, which if you pull all the numbers together, kind of translates towards net zero CO2 um, by, by 2045. But I think in general, one of the things that we were very keen to emphasize is that it's one thing to have long-term targets and what but what you really need are interim measures to support those those long-term targets um what we wanted to do was simply translate what the governments had had said they want to achieve to um to, towards this this long-term goal but if you don't have these sorts of um interim targets you're not going to achieve the long-term goals and therefore, we do see that all com all countries and I would also say all companies need to need to up their up their ambition. And I appreciate that. And obviously, each country comes at this from a different angle. I mean, there's a focus, for example, on China. Of course, it's not regarded as an emerging economy as we understand it in the IEA report, and therefore falls within the sort of the need for an almost more accelerated change. You know, as you just described for the developed economies. I mean, if we focus on countries such as China and India, where the manufacturing industry, the heavy industry there is so significant for, for the future for net zero, do you see how those countries can turn around their internal policies and their decarbonisation um, strategy? So again, we we actually classify in the report, China was included as part of the emerging market and, and developing economies um, mm. group. Um, and of, of course, I mean, if you're to achieve global emissions by 20, uh, net zero by 2050, every every country needs to therefore be at net zero or very, very close to net zero by 2050. And, and this doesn't always align with what the existing um, pledges of um, of China or of, of many other countries um, have actually um, put in place. And but one thing we wanted to do was show how those um, how those countries can start to transition the sorts of measures that they need to put in place. But also one of the things that we highlight is the importance of, inter of international collaboration and international cooperation in order to help um, not just China, not just India, but all, all of the emerging market and developing economies to achieve net zero emissions. One, one of the very clear um, conclusions that we make is that without international cooperation, 
it's not going to be possible to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And this, this includes both in terms of um, assisting financing of clean energy technologies and, and clean energy projects in those countries, and also in terms of innovation, because there's a real need to make sure that there's the, the technologies are available to those countries at the time scale that they need in order to achieve this. Kind of having a very parochial view or just you know, you know thinking that well if, if if we as a domestic country achieve net zero by 2050 that's sufficient for the world one thing that we actually saw is that's not the case it really, it's really needs to be a global effort everyone working together towards this goal otherwise it's it's not going to be possible no thank you and i uh, that's very clear in the report and we'll obviously put that to some of our panelists later as well who have a have a view on the on the global um challenge and also how to make those investments just looking at the questions that are coming in, perhaps we could just focus on new technology for a second. I mean, you spoke about hydrogen in your in your presentation and, and nuclear also features, interestingly, I saw in the report and people don't really speak about nuclear as much. It's not as trendy if we can use that word as discussion around hydrogen, but certainly both require investment and some R&D really in terms of being able to, to drive a drive a future. Where, where do you see Sort of hydrogen playing out and 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 the need for sort of accelerated investment and perhaps also just if you can touch on nuclear and just briefly that would be great as well. So so on hydrogen, I mean hydrogen is one of the 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 key topics that we really highlight that that um, that that needs efforts and it, and because it, it's going to play a key role. I mean it's it it actually plays a role across the whole energy system in our in our scenario. A lot of the focus on hydrogen is often in the transport sector, and we do have hydrogen playing a role there, particularly for, for long distance um, heavy trucks, for example, hydrogen is one of the key technologies that's, that's available. But it's also important in a lot of industrial processes and, and for example, steel manufacturing, there are in, innovative technologies available which can use hydrogen and low carbon hydrogen to reduce um, um, emissions from steel manufacturing. Similarly, there's lots of of of, uh, of places um, in in the cement um, uh, sector, for example, that that could use hydrogen, and then also in the, in the power sector. It's again, it doesn't play a huge role in terms of of actual generation in the power sector um, hydrogen. However, it does play an important role in terms of balancing. Um, one of the key um, potential issues with the very rapid increase that we have in solar and wind is that you will these are intermittent. Um, sources of electricity and therefore they require some backup and if it's intraday backup you have batteries which are, are very, very um, good for that and we have a huge ramp up in, in batteries but when, when you have inter-seasonal fluctuations which also occurs with wind and solar that's where hydrogen can really start to play a role and we do have hydrogen and hydrogen based fuels coming through um, in, in the power sector um, on nuclear we actually have a doubling in nuclear uh, generation uh, between today and 2050, so it's it is it's a big increase in nuclear. However, because the overall um, very rapid increase that we have in electricity generation in, in total, actually the share of nuclear does does fall back slightly. Um, but again, even for nuclear, there's there's a role there for, for innovation because it's not just about the kind of the existing way that we think about nuclear. There's also a potential role for things like um, small modular reactors, um, which are kind of at the earlier stage, a, a lower technology readiness, which again, they will require support to, to, to get them off the ground and then to deploy them at the, at the pace that's necessary. There's so many questions I could ask you, Christoph, but I think we should bring some, some additional views to, to join the conversation with us from our panel. So if I ask you to hold tight while I introduce our, the other panelists, um, and then we can open up the discussion further, but thank you very much indeed for the meantime. So I'm very pleased now to be joined by some energized speakers on this topic and have a wealth of experience and viewpoints to bring to the conversation that Christoph and I have started. I'm going to introduce them one by one and ask them after a brief introduction, just to give their two, two minute view on what they've heard so far. Um, their sort of feedback, if you know, initial feedback on the IEA report, um, and just to give you all a sense, of course, of, of, of where they're coming from. So I'm going to start with Tim Lord, who's a senior fellow at Net Zero, Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, Obviously, somebody who worked for almost 20 years on climate, energy, and institutional policy development for the UK government. So free, free of its his government business card, but wearing wearing his Tony Blair Global Change business card well, I think, for this debate. And so, Tim, if I just just hand to you, just to really just have your your observations and initial thoughts on what you've heard today and on the report, that would be great. 
Sure, thanks, uh, Karina. It's, it's great to uh, to be here, in particular because I think the event title is so interesting on the hard reality. Because I think actually there's a choice about uh, how hard the reality looks for this sector, and the IEA report that Christoph talked about lays that out. I'll just talk about three things very briefly on that um, in, in terms of my reflections. Three P's. So one is pace, one is politics, and one is private finance. So in terms of pace. I think we're only just starting to internalize how quickly this transition needs to move. And Christoph talked about the kind of forward look. If we look backwards, the global climate movement started in earnest in about 1990, at which point about 87% of our energy came from unabated fossil fuels. We've had 30 years of talking about it, and it's felt quite a rapid transition in lots of respects, but we're now at 84%. And that needs to come down to pretty much zero by 2050. Look at it another way. We've spent 170 years increasing our emissions, and we've got 30 years to reduce them. So six, we need to decarbonize six times more quickly than we've carbonized. And my view is that that will happen, but the question is kind of how disruptive and disorderly is that transition? And we're already seeing some of that disruption with, you know, we've got a lot of legal challenges in the UK, we're seeing lower returns on fossil investment. So I think the first thing is about how do we learn from where we have delivered the required pace of transition in sectors like offshore wind here in the UK, and how do you transfer that uh, to other sectors? And the second P is about the politics. So it's worth remembering, I mean, here in the UK, net zero wasn't even mentioned in any manifesto in the 2017 election, including in the Green Party manifesto. By 2019, 95% of voters supported parties who had it as a key commitment. It was on page one of the Tory manifesto. It was chapter one of the Labour manifesto. And you're seeing that globally as well. And the political response to that, forget about net zero, 2030 targets, they're all on different baselines. They're all horribly confusing, but basically they mean cutting emissions in big economies by 40 to 50 percent in the next 10 years and that's from political pressure that's come as a result of less than one degree of warming and there's two things i highlight from that the first is that most company strategies just aren't aligned with that they are not going to deliver 40 or 50 percent cuts so something has to give on those corporate strategies or on the politics and you can take your own guess as to which of, that, of those uh, will be true but something's got to give there and the second thing i take from it is that politicians need help because what they're trying to do is set out a positive vision around jobs and around technology deployment, deployment, but they need the sector's help with that. Because I think the risk, if that doesn't work, is that politics become very polarized. The high carbon investment's unacceptable um, because it causes climate change and low carbon investment doesn't happen because the politics haven't created the conditions for it. And then the third point is just, just about private finance very briefly, because we heard about the global challenge on that. In the UK, it's probably about one to one and a half trillion over 30 years. That's 50 billion a year. The public sector isn't going to fund that because it simply can't. So in some ways, it, it's, a, it's a pretty simple challenge, which is that we need business models for these technologies to deploy. And in, in the case where we have that business model, renewable generation, it's happening quickly. But the challenge is that government can't design those business models on its own. Certainly my experience of being in government is that it's quite good at giving the kind of big capital infrastructure investments up front quite good at setting long-term targets, but it's the bit in the middle where you develop the business models, which is a real challenge. And I think, again, the sector has a really important role there, not simply to say we need a business model, but to really help in terms of the design of that business model so that investors can get the return they need, whether those investors are building nuclear power stations or buying heat pumps in houses like the one that I'm sitting in. So I think it's those three Ps that I would uh, I would focus on from the, uh, from the excellent IA report. Thanks. Well, thank you, Tim. I think we can all get behind the message that politicians need help. That's for sure. <laughs> and talking of company strategies, I'm going to I'm going to elegantly shift over to introduce James Brooks, who's um, clearly focused on that as part of his day job and VP of strategy and portfolio renewable and energy solutions at Shell. James is, is a leader in the energy and sustainability sector with 20 years of experience behind him. Um, you've been in the role at Shell since 2020, James, of course, operating on the leadership team looking at Shell's activities across power, mobility, hydrogen, and the nature-based solutions with responsibility for driving that strategy. So you've heard from Tim, obviously, that you're up there as one of the P's, James, but I wanted to just give you a two or three minute um, platform to say what you thought also of the report and any observations coming out of, of Christoph's presentation. Um, thanks, Karina. Um, I, I, um, it's a fascinating topic, the opportunity to stand back from my day job where I'm trying to deal, build the business models that Tim's talking about in a, in a daily uh, a daily setting, right? And um, there's a lot I could say about the report, but I'll start with one kind of pillar, which is it's embedded in the report. There's a concept of behavioral change, 
that's required by all of us. We can't rely on companies alone and politicians to drive uh, this transition. We're all going to have to sacrifice something. And the question comes, how, who sacrifices what? What are the tensions between different parts of the economy and different populations? Are we going to be willing to travel less than our parents, drive smaller cars than our parents, live in smaller homes that are more energy efficient? Now, of course, there will be business models that mean that maybe life continues to improve and the wealth of nations increases, but we have, we have an environmental debt to the world around us that we need to repay. And part of the energy transition is, of course, about reducing our impacts on, on the world and repaying some of it person, uh, you know, personally and as economies. Now, this, this, you, you, when you start to layer in all of the different concepts in the report, it becomes very daunting. But that, that by nature, that means we have to step up to the challenge. It's almost like the space race where you have to sort of advance um, technologies faster than we otherwise typically would and find commercial applications at scale. Now, policy implementation needs to be faster. We need massive global collaboration on technologies and industrialization. We need massive access to raw materials. We need to stabilize the energy grid, power grid, um, moving it from dumb infrastructure to active infrastructure. Um, and we need to, and but the single biggest thing we have to address at a global level is this tension between economies. Uh, otherwise, we're never going to get there. And I, I hope that's what we get out of COP26. Um, but we have to, one thing's for sure, we have to move a lot faster um, as economies, as companies, um, and as individuals. Thank you, James. Well, I appreciate the thoughts. And we'll come back, I think, to pick up on some of the points that you're raising there when we when we open up the, the panel. And I suppose the final panelist really to introduce to all of you today is, is Peter Dixon, who's going to fund the energy transition for all of us, which is good news. A partner at Glenmont par Partners, Peter, who's worked in the clean energy field since the, the late 1990s and obviously has been at the forefront of huge amounts of clean energy investment at Glenmont um, and, and, and worked with them obviously since 2007. So Peter, just sort of handing over to you, we're going to focus a bit in the panel, of course, as you know, around the investment requirements to get us there. But do you want to just give sort of your thoughts and following James and Tim on, on what you've heard today? Yeah, no, thanks very much. And thanks, Kavina. Thanks for uh, inviting me onto the panel. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing I noted at the, uh, at the outset was that uh, Tim mentioned we have 30 years to save the world. Well, my career in renewables has been just about that, and uh, I'm not sure I've seen enough change so far. Um, but one thing that I'm aware of, I'm going to look back a little bit to begin with, just to make some observations. You know, when, when we started in the renewable sector, probably the mid 1990s, when things started to accelerate, there was a, a sort of a, a move towards uh, uh, decarbonisation of the energy sector, particularly in Europe. And Europe's motivation in this in, in this instance wasn't necessarily altruism. At that stage, it was probably more about energy security. You know, Europe is probably the biggest importer of hydrocarbons, second only to Japan in the world. And it did see the sensitivity of, uh, of, of imported hydrocarbons. And that's why really it set, the, it set the, the regulation to begin with. It set the targets and it set the, the pricing controls that existed. Now that was coincidental because in 2008, when the financial crisis hit, what we had was a, a, a huge surge of additional capital being pumped into the economies and a lowering of interest rates. Institutional investors at that stage probably found that the, their fixed, uh, fixed income um, investment measures were not giving them the yield that they wanted. And there was a sudden surge of investment into renewables. Renewables at that stage gave an alternative to fixed income investment measures. Uh, you had a, a fixed price, you had a pretty uh, defined and predictable yield, and the large targets meant that there was a, there was a, a very large sector for, for, for capital to flow into. And that's what's really sort of pushed things forward. And over the last 15 years, we have seen this huge surge of investment into the into the sector, probably driven by that. Now, they, 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 the positive thing there means that if the market is there, the investors will will uh, will invest. There's huge amounts of capital available, and they can make themselves available for, for that. But the other thing is it has to be borne in mind is that you have to understand what is the motivation of the capital. You can't just you can't just say that we have a, a, an issue here 
and with the, we, we need capital to invest in it, you have to make sure that it's suitable for capital to invest into that. Now, I think looking back, we've made huge strides. There's been a, a huge decarbonization already of the, electric, of the electricity sector. But one thing I might comment on is that I think that's been the, the easy yards. I think the hard yards are ahead of us. Now, when Tim was speaking, he had three Ps. I think if I if I look at the IEA report, the thing that jumped out to me was was a fourth P, and that was actually a list of practicalities. There are there's a large number of practical measures, which is incredibly helpful, and actually I I would thank them for that because I think it's a it's a very well laid out report, and I'm I'm delighted to see the the, the statistics and the practicalities that are in there. But it does jump out at me that it's practical. There are measures there, but they're all very fragmented, and it's very different from what we've done in the past. Previously, we've been able to invest in very large utility scale investments, producing green energy to be sold into the, into the networks. Going forward, we need, well, just as, uh, as James pointed out, we need behavioral change. People need to buy more energy efficient houses. They need to select their building materials. They need to change their cars to, to, um, to EVs. They need to change their central heating systems. These sorts of things are very difficult to finance. Uh, they're, very, they're very fragmented. They're very small. There isn't the same uh, the same yield for investors from uh, from issues like that. So I would say that the next thirty years are going to be harder than the previous thirty years for that reason. That it's going to be smaller, more fragmented, and more um, and more difficult to get finance for. But I also want to be very positive in that the technology already exists. We've managed to innovate hugely over the past thirty or past fifty years. Uh, we've produced new technologies. Capital is available and, and investors, uh, banks, lenders, everybody is very familiar now with the concept of sustainable energy and decarbonization. The population, I think, are motivated, um, you know, exactly as, uh, as, as Tim pointed out. It's now in every manifesto in this country, and I would suggest across many countries around the world, it sits in political manifestos. I think the, I think the, the will is there to succeed among populations. And I believe that it, uh, it, 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 is, it is possible to achieve these targets, but the focus has got to be on the individuals, on individual citizens, and, and behavioural change. Well, I think that's a very positive emphasis on the will, and I think that that would, everyone would, would would stand behind that statement. So let's let's maybe, and I can ask Christoph and James to turn your cameras on. Let's 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 open up the conversation, and let's maybe focus on the way if we if we've sorted out the will, and and maybe Tim, I'm going to come back to you and sort of combine a couple of points that I've heard and also that came out of Christoph's presentation. I mean, you had the advantage of being inside the UK government at the time of huge climate change policy activity, or certainly the development of the early stages of, of that, really right through to the, some of the latest policies. And and Christoph himself picked up on the fact of, you know, a domestic policy, frankly, just isn't enough. You know, you can't sit there and come up with a domestic policy and ignore where your goods are coming from, which may be from another part of the world that doesn't have the same sort of policy. So. Do you think it's incumbent on governments to sort of blink first, if I can call it that, right? There seems to be a bit of a Mexican standoff, a little bit across industry as to who's going to who's gonna move first. Do you, do you think the governments have to lead on net zero strategy and set out the requirements, or at least the initial requirements for the private sector to follow? Or do you think there's a different order of play here? No, I, I, I think broadly speaking, that's right. Governments do need to set the targets. This is a this isn't this is a technological transition, and obviously the the IEA report talks about that really extremely well. I think, but it's also a political and a social transition. It does require us all to do things, and politicians uh, and governments have to be uh, at the heart of how we do that. They, they also have to you know they have to structure the markets in the right way. They have to pump prime investment um, for first of a kind uh, technologies and and all those kinds of things. But I do think that, that the private sector, and in particular this sector, has an enormously important role to play in, in, the, in the practicalities uh, of that transition, as, as others uh, have said, and also in selling it. I think one of the things that worries me most about this transition is that, is that politicians sort of pivoted now to a kind of, this is all win-win, um, but they, they haven't really articulated the vision for what a net zero world looks like. And they also haven't very well, I think, we generally haven't very well articulated the counterfactual if we don't do this stuff. Because the counterfactual isn't that we carry on with the kinds of uh, investments and the kinds of business models that we're looking at now, because within 10 to 15 uh, years, or perhaps a little longer than that, those business models will simply not be sustainable because of the kinds of physical impacts that we're seeing from climate change. And I think they need, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, a lot of help from the companies that interface with consumers and the companies that are actually investing in that transition to help set out that positive uh, view of the, of the future. 
and to deliver the kinds of jobs and the kind of real investments um, that make it that make it feel real uh, for consumers and for voters. Do you think governments are willing to go the extra mile to to to, to assist in the behavioural change that's required? I mean, are governments brave enough to create a cost to the consumer in their policies? Because we talk about behavioural change, you know, the question is often asked, you know, would I give up five percent of my pension pot to have a net zero future for my children? And, and and everyone sort of merrily says yes, but the question is when when does that reality get get driven by governments? It's one of the questions we've had coming through. I think it's an interesting one to to match with what we're hearing around behavioural change. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Are governments willing to do that? Do you think, Tim? So I think I think that's clearly the last bit of, of the transition, and I think that's something that we have to lean into more. I mean, I, I think two main things in this. One, one, I go back to that point about the counterfactual that the world. Whenever we modelled net zero in government, we had to kind of figure out what counterfactual we used. And the counterfactual we tend to use is, in effect, climate change doesn't happen. So the UK doesn't decarbonise, but magically, you know, everyone else does and everything's kind of fine. And that's not a genuine counterfactual at national level. It's not a genuine counterfactual for voters. And the second thing I'd say is I worry a bit that we focus too much on behaviour change of consumers and the kind of scale of behaviour change. Because what are we really asking consumers to do? When you look at, say, the, the Climate Change Committee advice on net zero, we can fly about as much as we do now. We can still have cars, it's just they're electric, but they'll be cheaper anyway. So that doesn't feel like a huge problem. And in fact, I think in some ways, handling the pace of that transition will be the hardest bit rather than driving the pace of it. We need them to recycle more and, and perhaps consume a bit less of some products, but in general, not necessarily consume a huge amount less. And we need them to insulate their buildings and get low carbon, key, get low carbon heating systems. And that is, I think the hardest bit and government clearly needs to be making the case for those behavior changes and putting in place the right support for people to be able to make them but they don't feel like insurmountable challenges in some ways i think the much harder bits of this transition are the stuff that the energy sector needs to deliver around hydrogen production around ccs and around the scale of power generation and networks that support that transition no i think it's an interesting point i mean i think it everyone points to somebody else that needs to change, but ultimately it's a combination of everyone changing that will get us there. Let's pivot the focus slightly and, and, and look at the oil and gas industry if, if we can. And James, I'm going to come to you because I'm going to give you give you some sympathy for your for your role in developing a strategy around new energies for Shell, because you, you heard from Christoph and you saw in the report two very interesting facts or, or certainly um, positions that came out of that. One which is the increase of, of OPEC oil um, um, sort of contribution, if you like, to, 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 the, to the fossil fuel component of the, of the future energy mix. And then uh, the other one, of course, was, was a statement that the oil and gas industry can effectively stop upstream development at this point and, and, and look at sort of sweating out their assets at the moment. And, and that's tough, right? If you're sitting in an IOC, that's, that's pretty tough and trying to work out what your strategy is. I mean, does every IOC have to become a sort of international energy company? I mean, we talked about business models needing to adapt. And obviously that's what you're focused on, James. So I wanted to get your thoughts on, on those conundrums, if you like, from an IOC perspective and generally from the oil and gas industry. Um, not a small topic, of course. No, not a small one. <laughs> and I, th I think that there's two ways to answer this, right? One is in our heads and then the other is in our hearts. And uh, in our heads, we all know that the world is going to change and the nature of consumption of energy is going to change. And therefore, the nature of what an oil and gas company needs is needs to change. And that, that kind of goes to the heart of the matter. Yes, right now, we are engineers who produce oil and gas and products and sell them to customers. But through doing that, we've had a very effective and trusted brand with consumers. And our, our shareholders have learned that we can deliver big projects, Sometimes well, sometimes badly, but we can deliver them in the scale of infrastructure. We can market complex products and we can deliver solutions at scale to customers in an integrated way. Now, we can be a lot better at that. And it, so the energy transition for companies like Shell is using our strength downstream. Now, marketing and power businesses that approximate the customer to build off those. So, but but in, embedded in this is this is a new battleground, and the oil companies don't have a right to succeed. We don't have an automatic right to win, and therefore we do have to innovate and stay ahead of competition. But we have to give up on some of the things, the foundational things that have made us successful in the past. That goes to our heart. 
our hearts need to transition and admit that we may not succeed, and then we'll have the ability to fight. I think this is this is sort of a make or break period. The oil and gas players need to either decide to become international energy companies or um, decline with our oil fields and transition the capital to other more successful models. Um, that simple. And invest it to, to the point on investment. There are vast, vast amounts of money that are going to flow into the sector, into the successful business models. And investors in those capital sources will define the successful companies of the future. And they don't need to be the oil companies. And so where are your, I mean, where do investors go with that? I mean, we've obviously heard there's, there's a whole range of an, 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 an investor viewpoints on this separately. And obviously, Peter's going to come in and talk about it from a financing point of view, which is also an investment broadly in the market. But do you think um, the, the, I mean, and every IOC is different, so I appreciate, you know, and I appreciate it's a difficult question, but do you think it's possible to see that transformation of business model into an, an IEC model? Not necessarily saying that's what, you're focused on, but certainly some of the companies are. Do you think that's possible to go that to go that route? Um, absolutely, but but I think we we are um, the whole sector is about uh, is asking itself, what's the right question for me to answer? What's the business model and the section of the market I'm going to go after, and I'm going to try and win? And why do I have a competitive advantage? And why can I deliver attractive returns to investors in that space? Do I have to own the whole space, no. And so different energy companies are going to go in different directions. And that's a very interesting evolutionary path. Our own strategy um, announced the market was very customer centric. Digital enabled customer centricity, managing flows of electrons and other products around it. Other people are focused on ownership of the infrastructure. So we'll go, the market will, I, I'm a firm believer that the market will choose the winners. Customers will choose the winners, investors will choose the winners. And we're, we're very focused on being one of those winners. But I don't think an IEC as a generic is going to exist. I think that you've got a far more relevant classification for me is the green energy majors. You have 80% or 70 percent of their income coming from green infrastructure and a flow of capital in that direction. I want to be a green customer business. But what does that mean? And I'm, I need to define it. I, I have the scale at Shell to be category defining. So I want to go and define a category where I have a defensive position and a sustainable advantage and create a model business model that allows me to replicate the economic success of the IOCs in the last hundred years. That's my challenge and the rest of the uh, team at Shell. But that's an exciting one to uh, bring to bring into the market. Very exciting and a, a lot of people to bring along with you on that journey, of course, James, and, you know, there's a lot of history and successful history in the IOCs, which is it's time, you know, that evolution, I'm sure, isn't easy. Uh, pi pioneers yeah. and engineers. And if we can bring back the spirit of being pioneers and engineers, I think we can we can win. Well, there's lots of discussion around that. And actually, you know, Christoph mentioned that in his presentation that the innovation of the oil and gas industry I mean, the obvious example is sort of floating wind in the sense that really the oil and gas industry is so well placed to produce some of that technology and and to be able to drive, you know, execution of those particular models. So I think that's a that's definitely the, the point also that comes out of the report. But let, let's talk about the investment because you touched on it, James. And Peter, I want to bring you in at this point. You know, you've, you, you talk about the future being a sort of fragmented investment environment, which is very interesting. I mean, I would say that you know, you and other banks and investors have had a nice ride, shall we say, in relation to the European renewables market, if I can focus on that. The governments have done their bit. We've had our feed-in tariffs, we've had our CFDs, we've had lots of subsidy support, um, and, and the margins are such that it's attractive for you, but, you know, keeps the sort of long-term fixed income aspect, which is important. If we, if we drive the acceleration at the pace that the report looks like, there's risk in that. And there's innovation in that. There's there's technological innovation. There's brand new structures really for how customers are buying these products now. Is the financial services sector, with all its money, going to be able to take more risk? Do you think that you're ready for that part of the energy transition? And and do you think it's time to sort of stretch the envelope a little bit of of, of where your partners would be looking for, for for their next investment as well? Yeah, I think the energy. Oh, sorry, the the. the, the financial services sector certainly is ready for more risk. I think the question is how much more risk <laughs> to take. I think that they've 
they've become comfortable with the energy sector and as you see what's occurred you know they, they begin to realize that that things are things in this sector are not as as um, as as wild as they might have been seen to be however there's a big however hanging there technological market is not is not necessarily the the, the home ground for institutional investors particularly international global institutional investors um, it's a point that i have discussed many times with at uh, consultations when when uk policy comes out they have a consultation period uh, it'd be interesting I want to talk to tim about some point where where investors are invited to respond to the consultations but when your investors are maybe a pension fund in, uh, in japan or a, a, a sovereign wealth fund in malaysia or or, or whatever they're not going to respond to these consultations and therefore they're not actually going to be able to, to modify their approach according to the way techno uh, regulation is is, uh, is is changing. The point I'm trying to make is that the institutional finance is a huge resource that is available to back up um, investments and it can be a real game changer as we've seen over the past 20 years but it doesn't drive innovation and it doesn't drive um, volatile markets and, uh, and, and difficulties in that nature and that's why we do need um, the majors we need the, the the power majors potentially the oil majors people who have got the, the capacity to take the technological risk the innovation risk um, associated and in some cases the market risk you know in volatile electricity markets we tend to have ppas with a floor built into the uh, into the ppa so that somebody else will take that risk of volatile power markets we don't tend to take the uh, the development risk of offshore wind farms less so floating offshore wind farms but the oil majors, it's their, it's their bread and butter. So I think what we have to see is a joined up set of investors, including the strategic investors, the, the strategic oils, uh, and technology companies, electricity companies, with institutional capital sitting behind them to do the heavy lifting when it comes to the volume. Um, and together, I think we can do something which is which is truly wonderful. And I think it has to be. But I do, I they they. The point that was inherent in your question to begin with is, is it right for the finance sector to take the, this level of risk? No, I don't believe it is. Um, and that's why I do think that there is a, there's an integrated role for all the players in this market for the right ho horse to, to, uh, to, to run on the right course and, uh, and, and do this together. I mean, that, that creates challenges, of course, if we think about developed versus developing economies even more so. I mean, I think. I think what you're saying, Peter, and forgive me if I'm paraphrasing, but it's for the governments or the private sector to stand behind certain risks to get them away effectively in a financeable in a financeable manner. Of course, if you look at certain economies that need to move even far, you know, even further, then those risks are even more exacerbated, of course. And it's it's difficult to see, you know, uh, how how there's going to be enough balance sheets to stand behind some of those risks. And so obviously we need to to have a global solution. I don't know, Christoph, just to bring you in on this, whether you've got a view on on the investment side, I mean, you speak a lot about R and D and innovation. I mean, that's risk in itself, right? New technology pushing brand new, brand new ways of of, of getting ourselves to net zero. Where do you, where do you think that money's coming from, Christoph? In terms of the IEA, where do they? I mean, I appreciate it's a collaboration, but but where do you think the core investment sources need to be in those areas? Thanks, Karina. Well, I'm going to sound a bit like a, a broken record here, but essentially. Um, our view is always that governments have the key role to play in, in a lot of this, and, and I think this is this is also the case for for innovation. Um, there is a lot of risk in the, a lot of these te new technologies, and governments have a have a really key role to play. This is both in terms of funding, kind of the the very initial prototypes. So there there are some technologies that we have in our net zero pathway, which play a role in the 2040s and are essential to reaching net zero emissions. Which are only really at the small prototype stage today so they're only just out of the laboratory and getting them from where they are to where they need to be um, needs to happen incredibly quickly um, we, we we looked at kind of the pace of technology innovation that's required and in in most cases these, te these technologies need to get to market much much faster than has ever been the case for, for clean energy for technologies in the past and the only way that's going to happen is if governments really, really step up and really start to, to, to kind of invest more money in initial um, R&D. Um, and then it's also about getting the market conditions right to kind of get the buy in from from the private sector. Um, obviously, of course, a number of, of private companies do, do really great um, innovation work, but some of these, these kind of um, 
less attention, um, technologies that get less attention tends to be tends to be the way often kind of can fall a bit by the wayside unless it's governments that really really step up. This is things like in a lot of industrial processes, um, hydrogen-based steel, for example, um, low emission cement manufacturing. I mean, these are these are crucial technologies to reach net zero emissions globally, but it's not that they're, they're not going to happen unless governments get get involved with them. No, I think that's interesting. And maybe Tim, I mean, you've been inside the room, so to speak, on this. I mean, the UK government has a history of supporting certain renewable energy sectors. I mean, we can come on to carbon capture. There's a few questions on that. Maybe we can pick up at the end. But there's a few other things that are, that are, that are hitting the, the checkbook of the UK government at the moment without wanting to use the word COVID. But there's, there's obviously a, a few things going on that might require investment. Do you think it's realistic? just looking at the UK government, that these innovative technologies and, and, and absolutely the industry changes that Christoph is referring to, are they going to get the attention and the money that they need, do you think, to get us where we need to go? I think they can, absolutely. And I, and I think it is it is possible. But, but I think also government and the sector have to think about things in a slightly different way. Because when we did the CFD, for example, we weren't really thinking about how much renewable electricity are we going to have in 2020. We were thinking about Three things really the cost of capital how do we get the cost of capital down it was too high under the previous scheme that is the key secondly we were thinking about risk allocation and thirdly we were thinking about how can we get competition in there and there's one anecdote from that which might be a bit illuminating i remember sitting in a room in about 2014 with a bunch of representatives from the from the sector and they all said if you um introduce competition for offshore wind projects you will kill the sector immediately we can't get under 140 pounds a megawatt hour for at least three or four more years. Um, and they took us through a very detailed presentation about why that was absolutely true. Now, what we ended up doing was we did introduce competition. Um, the prices fell um, to about 40 pounds a megawatt hour, and we're gonna build many times more offshore wind as a result. And so in some ways, I think sometimes the conversations are approached in a kind of slightly zero sum way, whereas actually genuine collaboration about what the long-term interests of a a particular company or sector on the long-term potential of that technology can be more important than the sort of short-term returns which i think is what they were uh, it's probably fair to say um, diplomatically more focused on at that point and that to me that kind of partnership approach which is i think what we ended up with on offshore wind that's the kind of approach that we need to replicate elsewhere if we go, if we are going to deliver the kind of innovation and the kind of scale of deployment in those technologies that we need i think i think that's interesting and your point earlier is, is obviously you know governments have willing to have these ideas brought up, you know, come come to us with the, with the ideas and, and collaborate. And maybe we'll come on to that in a bit because I, I appreciate I'm creating a slightly artificial silo in a way by asking you these different questions, but clearly it's about collaboration. And, and let's just, if I can come back to hydrogen, because there's quite a few questions on hydrogen, I want to come back to that. And maybe James, I can talk to you about where hydrogen features in your strategy. And, and just to touch a little bit on blue hydrogen, which is a, is a bit of a distraction. There's a question here, which I think is interesting saying, do you think blue hydrogen actually gets in the way of a net zero future? And I'm sure, Christoph, you may have views on that as well. You know, because ultimately it enables, and I'm reading from the question here, further development of fossil assets and infrastructure with the hope somehow of carbon capture ramping up for the wrong, you know, perhaps for the wrong use case. But anyway, that's that's the question on blue hydrogen. I'd just be interested to see your your views, James, on on the where hydrogen fits in the strategy as you develop it and and, and what you think of the, the the need to ramp it up very quickly. Um, so, so first of all, hydrogen sits right in the center of the battleground that we must win as Shell, okay? Um, we want to, to have, replicate our success in LNG globally in the hydrogen market. So, and, and, but the, uh, hydrogen uses, of course, hydrogen is already used today. There are um, refineries uh, and other industrial users who take very large amounts of hydrogen into their industrial processes, and we're already producing hydrogen. But of course, hydrogen needs to be produced cleanly and has, and therefore, the main challenge for me around hydrogen is not so much when people talk about, can you produce the power? Can you build the electrolyzers? It's this last mile infrastructure to actually getting genuine use cases into the economy. And therefore, our challenge is to uh, work out which parts of the economy you need to stimulate to create scale, to get root density, to get hydrogen usage increasing, and therefore naturally take up a competitive position, almost like a hub. Now, commercial road transportation is our key entry point, together with some very heavy industrial users. Now, 
Uh, that's sort of heightened. So hydrogen, we will invest very substantially in the next decade. If anything, we want to find ways of accelerating hydrogen beyond the current market forecast in the early years and so that we can sort of learn, adapt, benefit from regulation and accelerate in partnership with government. Because it is exactly that. We need to effectively show the way so government can see something successful and help enable it rather than just stimulate it with subsidies. So that is where we are in terms of um, engaging at the moment. Now, the trend, whole transition fuels debate is quite substantial, right? It goes beyond just blue hydrogen. It also goes into gas and the gas economy. And um, of course, of which blue hydrogen is the derivative of gas. So, um, blue hydrogen will be economically cheaper in many settings earlier in order to increase hydrogen. Now, when you use a hydrogen molecule, you don't know if it's a green hydrogen molecule or a blue hydrogen molecule or something else, but we need to produce high volumes of cheap hydrogen to get it used to then transition into green hydrogen. Now, some customers will think blue hydrogen is fine and carbon capture and storage is a good use, and some people will just want green, but we can supply those both. But we need to have, a, um, uh, we need to have both solutions. And I think that um, gas, scale of uh, gas availability, the scale of projects available uh, to produce hydrogen from blue hydrogen are very, very significant and will be an important part of the transition economy. But let's be clear, it's a transition economy position. U ultimately, you want green hydrogen. It goes to the earlier comment from somebody, I think it was Tim, around um, offsets and direct emissions versus uh, indirect emissions, right? So, um, we want direct, clean sources of power and energy. And ultimately, that is where we have to, to end up. So I don't know if that's the answer you want, but uh, blue hydrogen is very, very important, but it's, it's part of a transition. I wasn't looking for a specific answer, so you're all good, James. Anything, any, anything you said was going to be good on that one, but I think it is an interesting point. And, it, and obviously, there is a whole sustainability and ESG argument, even to green hydrogen in terms of water usage and what have you, in terms of making green hydrogen that's, that can take you into different levels of detail. And actually, maybe Peter, I was going to speak to you about one of the one of the the, the, the sort of focus on the financial services sector is, is is driving disclosure requirements, reporting requirements, standardization of those reporting and disclosure requirements, and and a lot of the um, the, the investor market, banking market, and capital markets is seen as being able to do a lot of good, if that's the right word, in that in that area around requiring disclosure. And I wanted to come back to that really and, and pick up on that with Christoph as well as to how do we test our success against this scenario? You know, how do how do we how do we make certain we're kind of on track and, and what if we're not? So I'll come back to that in a second. But Peter, on the on the disclosure and reporting point and the role that the financial services sector has on that, do you want to just add a couple of thoughts on that? Um, in respect, particularly to disclosure, um, well, I'll talk that way anyway. I think I, I think this, I think the idea of disclosure is actually a, a pretty smart use of um, light touch regulation because what it doesn't bluntly try to direct where people are uh, investing. It doesn't try to specify the, the the particular returns. All it does is it creates an incentive around a decarbonized approach, and and it's a it's a fairly light touch. Combined with other incentives and other market measures and so on, I think it's 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 very smart. It, along with a number of other um, initiatives, and and also I suppose another um, uh, drive drivers that exist inside the investor community are actually pushing people away from. Um, let's say, look look at coal-fired power stations. You know that's coming under under specific pressure. But even without that, there's a number of the larger institutions that are very unwilling. To, to invest in coal-fired power stations because they're very worried about future regulation and the direction of travel and any indicators of the direction of travel of regulation allows people to take a look into the future and consider what, if, if something isn't necessarily a risk now, what might be a risk in five years, 10 years time. You know, a coal-fired power station is generally built on a 20, 30 year um, financial model. And, and so therefore you have to be fairly confident that the, the market environment is going to remain favorable for at least that, that, uh, that, that period of time. You know, things like carbon disclosures, uh, the direction of travel on, uh, on uh, sustainability and so on is putting people off, even though the model looks particularly attractive right now, they can't be sure that it will be in five, 10, 15 or 20 years time. 
and therefore people are taking steps now that aren't specifically dictated by today's regulation because they can see the, the direction of travel. And to that extent, things like disclosure and so on, I think is a, is a very positive indicator for what might be occurring in the future. No, I think that's a very interesting point. I, I had a call this morning on a transaction which happens to be to do with green hydrogen, which was talking about sort of future proof and right for regulation and having to be really very conservative in the way you look at your output today to make certain you've got some buffer for what everyone anticipates as a tightening of the regulation. So it's a very yeah. interesting point. And and coming on to the sort of future, Christoph, I want to come back to you and because I think one of the key points, if not in some ways an obvious point, is the milestones approach to this to the scenario. And you know, not everyone waiting to 2049 and hoping there's a big green button, but obviously you know, now is key. And in fact, that first decade in the report is is so interesting. One of the questions um, that I had on this is, you know, there's obviously a sort of retraction of the oil and gas production side and an increase on the others. If we retract very successfully, but the increase, the accelerated increase doesn't happen, is there a possibility that in that accelerated scenario, we don't have enough fossil fuels at some point to, to, to create the energy needs that we have? Or do you think it's imperative that we effectively start both at the same time and, and hope for the best somewhat, Crystal? Yeah, thanks, Karina. It's a, it's a question we've received a lot in the past few days since the, since the report came out. And I think just as kind of way of background as to how we envisage this scenario coming about. And as I say, it's only one possible way towards net zero, and there's there's lots of other ways. But in our pathway, this is very much a demand-led scenario. You, you have government policies put in place that reduce the demand for fossil fuels and have this massive ramp up in clean energy technologies and energy efficiency and, and so on and so forth. And it's as a result of those demand-side policies that you reach this milestone that we said you don't require any new oil and gas fields beyond those that have already been um, developed. It's not the other way around. There's a bit of a cause and effect here um, that the, the no new field comes about as a result of the fact that you have this big change on the demand side. However, saying that, of course, there are many possible um, uncertainties or different things that could happen on the supply side. It's possible that um, you could have more investment um, than is what, is what is required. This would likely lead to lower prices, probably slightly more volatile prices. Um, there would be much more strand of capital in that uh, kind of uh, case. Or it could also be the case that, that demand kind of moves moves faster and you, you don't have enough um, enough supply. Um, and in that case, you would you would expect the opposite. You would expect again prices to prices to go um, up very high. Um, and in that case, there's 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 lots of risks that also exist. For example, if you have a big increase in in prices, it's perfectly possible that some producers will see this and then they will start to they will start to invest at those high prices. Um, quite often, if you have a high cost source of oil, it's high emissions. It's not always the case, but there is a little bit of a correlation between the two. And you could be locking in um, levels of, of uh, high emissions production, which won't be won't be required. Um, so it's very, very important to make sure that these things are kept in balance. Now, this is this is not to say that this is kind of you know, a government mandated way of keeping keeping this in balance. The market clearly has a very important role to play. But I think it's always worth kind of keeping keeping a careful watch as to what's required. Where is where is demand going? Are we on track? Are we not on track for the different milestones? And I think if we look very honestly where we are today, we are not on track for the for achieving um, 1.5 uh, degrees. Um, we, we could go through each of the individual te digital technologies from electric vehicles to, to solar and wind to hydrogen to everything. And given the pace of scale up that we have in these technologies in the net zero pathway, we're not we're not on, on track for very many of these technologies. And this is something that we in the IA are going to be probably doing in a, in a bit more detail going forward. This is tracking progress against the net zero pathway. Where are we doing well? Where are we not doing so well? And where do we need kind of much, much, much more effort? Basically, to, to provide that service to help people understand kind of um, what pace we're moving at. I mean, obviously, it needs to be a living, breathing thing, right? In the sense that you know, it, as as the report itself says, you don't produce this and then walk away to 2050 to see if it's been successful or not. And I and I suppose there are some risks in an accelerated move to net zero as well. I mean, we touched on the fossil fuel sort of delta potentially, but you've you've explained that I think, Christoph. Are there any other risks that you see? And, and risks as a broad category in such an accelerated move to net zero. I mean, that you, that you've looked at and preparing the report. I mean, perhaps it's worth just mentioning that 
we, as, as well as kind of achieving net zero emissions by 2050, there were a number of other objectives as part of this, as part of this scenario. First of all, there is, we have universal energy access being achieved by, by 2030. So today there's about 790 million people who don't have access to electricity. There's about two, two and a half billion people who use unclean cooking um, facilities, which is a, kind of a very large cause of indoor air pollution and, and causes a very large number of premature deaths every year. And we have a kind of complete electricity access by 2030 and, and a phase out of this unclean cooking um, facilities by 2030. Now, that's a very important part for, for a number of emerging and developing economies. And it shouldn't be thought that this achieving universal energy access is, is kind of in some sort of competition with reducing emissions. The two can very much go hand in hand. And I think it's important to always make sure that that is the focus for, for um, a number of, of uh, countries. The other thing, I mean, just to, just to mention, particularly in respect to oil and gas, is that we've mainly been talking about reducing CO2 emissions. And that's the main objective of the scenario is to achieve net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. But we also have a very big reduction in, in methane emissions. And this is one of the key things that we see that needs to happen in the oil and gas industry over the next 10 years is that they expend all efforts possible to minimize the emissions intensity of their oil and gas um, production. And there may be a shift away from you know, investing in, in new fields, but there's, there's an increasing focus on reducing the emissions intensity of, of production, and especially reducing the emissions intensity of methane. And again, we wouldn't want that to be forgotten by a transition which is going more quickly or less quickly, that it's also important to reduce the uh, methane emissions. Because again, if we don't do that, we're not going to limit the temperature rise to, to one and a half degrees. And, and just picking up on one question you got, you mean reducing emissions and not offsetting emissions, right? Just to be clear. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, in, just to say that for, for the whole scenario itself, um, in terms of CO2 emissions, this was the energy sector itself being zero CO2 emissions. There was no offsets from land use or from afforestation or from saying that you can reduce methane to offset CO2. This is achieving CO2 emissions from the energy sector and from industrial processes. I want to come on and ask all of you really as a final question, your views on what the most positive outcome of COP26 will be, just to give you a second to think about that. But before I do, and unfairly to, to not give Tim that second that I just promised him, Tim, there's lots of questions I'm having here. I just want to ask you about, about carbon capture just for a second. I know it's quite a specific point, but the general gist of the questions is the UK got that wrong, didn't invest where it should have done. And in fact, in your own words, perhaps that's not a misstatement in, in terms of your view of, of, of the focus on carbon capture. And, and the general view, of course, is to, to move away from, from, from that sort of technology, but to, to go sort of pure renewable, if you like. What are your views on carbon capture as part of the future of this change, Tim? I just want to pick up on you, given the history of the UK government on this topic as well, and then we can come on to COP26 for everyone else. Yeah, so the first thing I'd say is that when we introduced the net zero target, all the modeling we did around that was essentially you could get to 80% in the UK, the old target, without CCS. It's probably a bit, a bit cheaper with some CCS, but you could do it. It's almost impossible to design a net zero pathway for the UK without CCS. The second thing I'd say is that the government obviously has set the sixth carbon budget, so basically the 2035 target, that's a 78% reduction on 1990 emissions. And they set out in their impact assessment kind of how you get there. And that involves 40% of homes on low carbon heating by 2035. It involves like 26 million EVs on the street. It involves a zero carbon power sector, and it involves 50 million tons of CO2 captured and stored per year. And every ton of that you don't do means more electric vehicles or more trees or more heat pumps, all of which are already kind of turned up to 11. So it's a bite. So in my view, CCS is absolutely critical for the UK. Um, uh, and that's not a bad thing necessarily because we've got a lot of the you know the capabilities to do that. We've got we've got the kind of um, uh, storage um, uh, capability and so on as well. The critical thing for me is we've kind of lost a decade on CCS. A big part of that is obviously I was uh, working um, right at the time in 2015 when uh, the then government decided to uh, get rid of the uh, the pro the, the the one billion pound program. I think that set us back a huge a huge amount. The challenge for me now is about how do you get an investable business model? How do you get a price for that carbon that people can get behind? That is a really, really challenging thing to do. Uh, and that's something that the sector needs to work with the government to achieve. And there is a lot there is a lot going on in that space. But my view would be that is achievable. It does impose some cost. I mean, to think about how we manage that cost, how we fund that cost. 
that you simply, I don't think, can achieve our 2030 target or our 2035 target, let alone net zero without some really significant volume in CCS. And the government has a job to do there in terms of providing the stability uh, for investors to come in behind it. No, I think it's very interesting. And I think all those micro business models that need to work within the macro business models are also fascinating. But Tim, because you're 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 on my screen and I can see you clearest, I want to come on and talk about COP26. Of course, the IEA report um, was specifically written for input into COP26 and the meeting in Glasgow in November this year. And I, and I really want to just speak to all of you about what your kind of hopes and fears are for that meeting. I know it's a big question, but you all will have your views on what you think should come out of it. And Tim, I'm going to start with you. What do you what do you hope for the for the meeting in November to achieve? Um, I think probably three things. So the first the first is around ambition, but ambition accompanied by plans. We, we've we've come a long way on ambition, even in the last month, with you know the new US target, the EU target, the UK target was set towards the back end of last year. But I think we do need some specificity now, in particular on 2030, because you can kind of if you can get to 2030, then net zero will kind of look after itself, if you like, because you have to get on that pathway. Or to put it another way, if you don't meet your 2030 target, net zero by 2050 looks out of reach. The second thing which I think is under-discussed and under-focused on is about, uh, in particular, lower middle income countries in Africa, uh, Asia and elsewhere. There's, um, you know, the, the IEA report shows that they're net zero pretty quickly as well, actually. They've generally got emissions per capita far below, obviously, what we have in the, in the uh, more developed economies. I think there has to be a lot more focus about what this transition in practice means for them, because there's a lot of rhetoric around those countries leapfrogging their fossil fuels. Um, but what does that really mean, and how can they continue to grow economically, which they very reasonably uh, will see as their number one priority? And then the third thing for me is really about how it feels. This has to feel like a success. Uh, I was, you know, Copenhagen, uh, I worked on back in 2009. That was not a success, and we lost a huge amount of. Um, energy from this agenda uh, as a result. This has to feel successful. It has to feel forward leaning and it has to have all the big emitters on board because we need kind of Scott's the argument that what's the point in us cutting emissions if China isn't and all those kind of things. But I think that sense of um, the world coming together and having a really, really positive agenda on this is probably the most important thing. Thank you, Tim. And I think it's a great moment for the world to come together clearly as well. I mean, Peter, as an investor, when you look at COP26, what would you like to see coming out of it? I'm going to echo Tim's last point there. Most of all, actually, I think the the, the most important thing is for it to have a, a positive atmosphere around it, and an image of unanimity and a, and a clear direction of travel. Beyond that, I think they should, the, the the regulators and politicians should step aside and leave it to the investors and the and the private sector, because I believe that they will have the solutions. I don't think I don't think governments or any of the negotiators that will be at COP26 are the right people to pick winners. You know, I hear Tim talking about uh, CCS, electric vehicles, um, including offshore, and whatever, whatever it happens to be. I think the right technology and the right uh, solution can be can be pulled together by the, uh, the, the the private sector for that. And the private sector will be incentivized and uh, and um, uh, yeah, be incentivized to do that as long as it believes that we are on a trajectory which is not going to vary, is not going to be controversial. And there's not going to be any any uh, kinks in the road ahead, as long as they see that there's going to be a, a long-term commitment to this direction of travel. I think we'll see incredible innovation and, uh, and imagination going into this, and I think we can achieve anything. But I think the, the private sector will be the uh, the people that will will achieve it. Thank you, Peter. It's good to know you pick winners. You know, I think your inbox is going to be inundated <laughs> after this. <laughs> and James, talking of winners, um, what do you think COP26 is going to bring for the likes of Shell and what are you looking out for? Gosh, OK, I think um, for Shell, it would be so as, as, as James and as Shell, right? So I'd like uh, um, clarity of purpose and direction, common goals, alignment on carbon market principles, um, and therefore a foundational framework set by unified governments and policy and stakeholders to allow leaders to emerge from companies and take businesses on a confident transition in a clear direction. And so I think out of, out of COP26, we've got the opportunity to emerge from in a way, emerge from the pandemic and set a new pathway, right? A confident pathway where everyone's putting in the same direction, the clarity of purpose. That would be nice, right? We've had chaos for two years. We've had chaos since 
um, before um, the pandemic in many ways around these topics. And I think we, this is a, an opportunity to reset. Um, Thank yeah. you. No, no, I, I, and I, I completely agree in, in my capacity as Karina and otherwise that, that would be nice. I mean, I think Christoph really finally coming to you before we wrap up. I mean, as I mentioned, the IEA report was is designed to create input into to COP26. So I'm sure you've got an absolutely clear, crystal clear vision of, of what you'd like the output to be, given you're such a contributor. So do you want to just give us your final thoughts on, on what you would hope and the IEA would hope for, for COP26 to bring us? Indeed, thanks, Karina. And, and to be perfectly honest, I think um, it's been covered by a lot of what the others have, have, have mentioned, in particular Tim's point that we would like to see more ambition from from uh, from countries in particular, um, but ambition that's backed up by the near term plan. So it's all well and good having a net zero 2050 or, or 2040 or 2060 plan, but actually having the near term measures that are in line with that goal, that is um, is, is really going to be the, the big test. But I mean, just perhaps to add one additional thing, which I would really like to see, is there being a much more positive voice from a lot of the, the large oil and gas resource holders in, in the discussions that, that there are. Um, one of the things that our roadmap highlights is that yes there will be challenges to a lot of those those countries but there should also be opportunities and in particular over this period of 2030 there should be a lot of opportunities for for those uh, countries to make the most of the their their resources from shifting towards the lowest emissions types of oil and gas towards shifting towards low emissions fuels and having those countries recognize that this is an opportunity for them and therefore being a positive part of the discussions i think would be extremely beneficial Thank you, Christoph. And I think, and thank you all. I just want to really wrap up there. You've you've been really fascinating, and the contributions are, are, are really excellent. And thank you to the audience for all the questions that we've had. That hopefully I've managed to weave sufficient numbers of those questions into the conversation that we had. I apologise for those I didn't get to. I mean, I I I I think we've had a lot of very interesting themes here. The report is fascinating in terms of what it sets out as the need for collaborative change and accelerated path towards net zero 2050 but i think the achievability of it is something that you've you've heard if if not the ambition but the achievability really is the focus i think for for all for all people moving forward so on behalf of the energy institute and the world petroleum uk council we just wanted to again thank the sponsors of today's event hka and shell for all their contribution and support i want to personally thank the energy institute and the wpc as well for supporting me and being able to chair this event and 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 having such a great conversation with such interesting people today. We really do value feedback um, and improving our webinar. So we'll be really grateful for those of you that, that, that have time to fill in the short feedback survey that will pop up in the browser once this session ends. And just to remind you, the webinar has been recorded. It's going to be available afterwards and will be sent out to all of you that registered. So thank you again, Christoph, Tim, Peter and James for your time. I really do appreciate it and for your contributions and for everyone else. And so hope to see you all soon. So take care. Thanks very much.